the Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. We're back today and we're talking about GLP-1 peptides and incretin hormones. Josh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say much else. I want you to please uh, <laughs> tell our listeners about GLP-1, what it yeah. is and how that plays a role in your practice. Yeah. So thank you, Sam. And so incretin hormones are hormones that are secreted in the gut, GLP and GIPs, and I'll explain those here in a second, but those are the two incretin hormones that I typically am, am working with. But, but essentially what they're doing, these incretin hormones are going to be stimulated by, you know, an intake of food or nutrients, and then they're going to help you regulate your postprandial metabolism. So they respond to what we give our body through nutrition. Um, you've got the two main areas that that I focus on would be the GLP. That's that's probably the most popular one. That's glucagon like peptide one, and we use the medications Ozempic, Wagovi, which is a receptor agonist, a so GLP one receptor agonist of that peptide, and then glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide, or we we abbreviate as GIP, and that's that's a peptide that as again as a receptor agonist we use in medications like Mongero and Zetbel, which is tercepatide. And so these these two medications, really the 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 main differences is where they act. You know, one acts more in the upper gut, one acts more in the lower GI tract. So are these all injectable or are they oral medications? Mostly injectable. There are well, there is an oral form, I should say, Rebelsis, which is a, a semaglutide oral, is available currently. But most of the time, these are injectable. And, you know, GLPs have been on the market for quite some time. You know, Trulicity, Bieta, those are older ones. But what they really, all these GLPs were initially treating diabetes. And, you know, some of these injections were once a day, twice a day, sometimes three times a day. So it was not very practical for people to really use that weight loss-wise just because of the complexity and frequency of dosing. And so as they developed these better and better and they started getting longer half-lives, what they were able to do now is, you you know, the frequency for most of these medications is a once-a-week injection subcutaneously. Got it, got it. And now GLP-1 peptide affects multiple systemic processes, the GI, right. neuro, cardiovascular, and bone metabolism. Yep. How, did, how do you lose weight? How does it help you to lose weight? Yeah, so I tell my patients there's there's essentially three mechanisms within this GLP. So, you, you know, it's going to affect the brain, and so that's going to create what we refer to as appetite suppression. I, I talk to my patients a lot about it quiets the food chatter. So if you are if you eat because you're emotional, if you eat because you're sad, if you eat because you're angry, it just kind of helps you suppress those desires. In the stomach, it slows gastric emptying, uh, which is good and has you know potential side effects you have to be aware of and then in the pancreas it enhances insulin sensitivity and decreases glucagon secretion as well as it decreases glucose production in the liver even in a fasted state so it really kind of enhances insulin sensitivity and suppresses your appetite would be kind of the easy way to think about it. is that kind of the same way that the gip works is it a similar mechanism it is the gip has a little bit less of the, the the brain activity, so it's not so much of an appetite. So that that's probably more the GLP kicking in. But the GIP, where it really differs, is it's it's its effect in the pancreas seems to be very active, and that's also one of the you know these these medications have some side effects like nausea, things of that nature. And typically, the combo GLP and GIP, like trisepatide and Gero, has a much less negative side effect profile because that GIP peptide just tend, tends to be a lot less aggressive on the GI tract itself and, you know, the gastric emptying and things like that. Gotcha. I remember you mentioning that nausea seems to be one of the big yeah. issues that patients experience with these meds. Yeah. Are there any other, you, you mentioned that as a risk associated with it, the nausea, are there any other common side effects or are there any potential adverse events associated mm -hmm. with these meds? Yeah. So, I mean, the most common is going to be mostly GI related. So think heartburn, indigestion. You know, I've seen a few patients, surprisingly with diarrhea, a few more patients where if they've been on it for a long, longer period of time, they experience some constipation. And so you've really got to, you've really got to educate the patients on, for example, just, 
you know, staying hydrated, right? Are they getting plenty of fiber? Are they getting plenty of water intake to try to offset that? But but most of the symptoms are going to be, or side effects are going to be GI related. You know, some of the bigger, maybe controversial areas it would be things like, you know, is there a risk for thyroid cancer? We don't use it in patients who have a family history of certain types of thyroid cancer, not because there's a great deal of data on that in the human trials, but there are some some rat studies that maybe show potential harm. And so we just choose not to do that. I don't use it in patients who have a history of pancreatitis. The literature is actually fairly favorable. That's It's about equal to the placebo when it comes to pancreatitis attacks. But, you know, if you've ever experienced pancreatitis or you've ever you know treated somebody with pancreatitis, they don't want it again. It's pretty devastating. And so I just tend to just stay away from those patients. You know, the, the, uh, probably two side effects that have gotten a lot of notoriety would be gastroparesis because, you know, if you're acting on the gut, is there a chance that the gut kind of shuts down? I've, I've clinically not seen it in the patient's ups, but, but again, I understand, you know, it definitely could work. I think a lot of the data that I see when it comes out with gastroparesis is patients tend to be on a very aggressive dose and they're not eating. And so they've got, they're, they're a little bit out of balance. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you should really go slow. So you start with a really, really low dose and you just titrate the dose very slowly and you should shoot for, you know, if you're looking for weight loss, you really probably should shoot for about a one to two pound weight loss per week, because that also negates the, the side effect controversy of muscle loss, because that's something you hear a lot. Uh, Peter Atia, who's, you know, longevity specialist that does a lot of podcasting and got a great following, but he talks, he, he's going to negative against the GOPs for that purpose. And and I understand why when you look at some literature, but I think it, it goes back to these are these are medications that you yes, they can be helpful, but they're not meant to be a crutch and not have lifestyle changes. So you've got to, you know, help the patient understand, listen, you you need to exercise. You need to eat plenty of protein. You know, we've got to give them nutritional support and exercise support and lifestyle support. Um, and not just say, hey, take this medication, still eat whatever you want. You're just going to eat less of it um, and don't exercise. Then sure, that patient's going to lose a lot of lean muscle potentially. But I think you can offset some of those side effects if you just treat that patient a little bit more holistically and educate them on the front end. Um, and, and, and I could share plenty of patients where we've had great results. One that comes to my mind, I saw her last week for follow-up. She, she was started with me at 196 pounds. She had 37% body fat. This was done on the body scan. Seven months later, she's down to 154 pounds and 23% body fat. And in that total weight loss, she lost about two and a half pounds of muscle. So you're going to lose some, but she's pretty happy with those results. And I am too, because I think that's pretty remarkable for what she's been able to do because we changed so many factors for her lifestyle in addition to using one of these medications to help her get those results. I think it's great to have that approach where you address multiple issues. You know, it's not just take this drug and you're better. You got to right. you know, modify your diet. You got to exercise. You got to do some of the other stuff. Insurance approval for this. I, you know, I is it, I guess they're approved for weight loss as well as treating, you know, diabetes, A1C. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. It, it so, is. And there's some other indications. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I imagine most people that are, you know, BMI greater than 40, obese, whatever, probably do have problems with their A1C and diabetes. So I can see how, you know, maybe it can be managed that way. Mm -hmm. Listeners, please join us again next week when we continue our discussion with Josh Porter on obesity medicine, optimizing an orthopedic surgery patient. Thank you for joining the OrthoPAC podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast. If this has been helpful, please take a moment to leave a review.